Start off season three dead. Here are some milestones for you. You're dead, <laughs> you come back to life. Um, the dude that you love's got some crazy clone in his head, which hasn't gone. And then he gets cloned himself. Yeah, there's uh, quite a few things that she went through and I think you can only get away with that in science fiction. <laughs> we can have sex if you want. Officer Aaron Sun, Special Peacekeeper Commando, Icarian Company, Plyzar Regiment. Identify yourself. I've done quite a lot of work in all the various media for, for actors. I started in a theatre and musical background and, um, and started, I think, the way that I got my first theatrical agent, she heard me singing. And shortly after that, she took me on. I did some commercials, and then what followed was quite a lot of work in television. Um, didn't do theatre for quite a while, and then when I finally did, it was um, Merchant of Venice, a tour through Europe. And, uh, and then back again to television, and over the last few years, it's been a bit of an overlap between film and television only. And this is the third lead female role I've done on a television series. One was filmed in New Zealand, one was in Australia. It was my first sort of big role, my first big break, as they say. Uh, that was a nurse, Claire Bonacci, who was sort of very ditzy girl, very different to the character Erin that I play on Farscape, um, or played, I should say. And, um, and the middle one was a lawyer, so I've always played very interesting roles, but certainly over the last few years, very strong ones. And science fiction certainly seems to be the genre for, uh, for strong lasses. I will not come with you. You've been irreversibly contaminated, remember? It means death. It is my duty, my breeding since birth. It's what I am. You can be more. People, um, when I went through periods of unemployment, would say, and I was, I've been very fortunate, they haven't been very long, um, well, it is the life you've chosen for yourself, Claudia. And I say, well, far be it from me to compare myself with someone like Mozart or Beethoven, but I think when you are an artist, I don't think you wake up one morning and say, OK, got to decide today, am I going to build houses or am I going to be a composer? I think there's something innately in you that you need to express. And I think that was very clear to my kindergarten teacher who cast me in my first lead role. Um, and I did a lot of amateur productions through school and some semi-professional ones with a, a brother school of ours that had uh, it was a very exclusive boys' school, so we were very fortunate to uh, be involved with them. And that's pretty much how I... I learned to sing and act, treading the boards there at a, at a school. And um, my parents had a heart attack when I told them that I wanted to pursue it professionally, but they were supportive at the same time. They just knew that it was a very difficult field to, uh, to get into and to succeed in, but I think they're very proud now, especially with Farscape, because it's something that their friends have seen as well on television. So it's, um, it's always been something I've wanted to do. I've always loved the music as well. and. Uh, I can't do anything else. I'm a terrible waitress, so it was acting or nothing. I was born a peacekeeper soldier. I've always been one among many. Member of a division, a platoon, a unit, a team. I've never been on my own, John. Never been alone. Ever. I have a lot of passion sometimes misplaced. And I think, I don't know, if I had to, I've never really had to analyze what, what drives me. I've just had a, um, a love and a passion of the performing arts, partly because of my family background. My grandmother was a uh, performing arts teacher with language and music and, and theater. And uh, my parents were very musical, even though dad was a massive, is a massive jazz fan, jazz fanatic. So he gave me a great taste of musical. Um, um, uh, you know, a great um, musical education in jazz. And um, my mum used to play the piano. And so my sister and I both were in a very um, creative environment when we were growing up. And I suppose um, where I've come from 
and what I'm passionate about pretty much propels me forward. And if I found something else that I liked better than, than performing, I'd do it. Um, I just want to be, whatever I do, I suppose the, the ethos that I've been brought up with or what I've carried with me is the fact that whatever I do, I just want to do it the best that I can. Um, but I am, I've been cursed by being a, a lazy perfectionist which is a terrible combination. So I, um, I chose the acting because I knew it was something that I, I, couldn't afford to, I couldn't afford to waste other people's time as an actor, so I had to be very diligent. So it's taught me an incredible amount of discipline. And while I'm trying to take everyone else seriously, I'm trying to take myself a little less seriously in the process. Talon, I want you to share something with me before he dies. You can taste something that is the night to peacekeepers. Something that you will never know. Can you feel that? I've learnt so many things from doing Farscape, partly because I've generally, by my nature, not done many things in my life for more than a year. School was mandatory, so I did that. I learnt to be patient, I learnt to take risks, and I learnt, sort of, to be a little kinder on myself. I had a lot of support from people, Anthony Simcoe and Ben Browder and Gigi, everyone, really, who were the tight-knit group that was the core cast of Farscape. We were all very good to one another, and uh, so I learned that uh, that actors can can be wonderful. I mean, I've always been drawn to performers, and sometimes you do have those negative experiences where you come across someone who who either doesn't take the profession seriously, or they've been spoiled. And we were just blessed. So I I, I learned to love a lot of people on Fast Game, and they made it very easy. And technically, I mean, it was the most overwhelming environment to work in. And when a lot of guest actors would come on, we had to remind ourselves that it was new to them and that they were probably overwhelmed when they came on to the sets. There are the animatronic creatures like Rigel and Pilot, six people at Rigel's feet to make him work, to bring him into the room, to do the eyes, the ears, the, you know, the voice. Um, to then be voiced over by another actor. Green screen, um, practical effects on set, fireworks, bombs going off. It was crazy. So I learned to, um, to multitask a bit. And, um, yeah, technically as an actor, I've had more time on a set of that kind than, than a lot of people. So it was an absolute blessing in terms of being a learning ground. We were in a rare situation filming Farscape because we were on the other side of the world, primarily making it for the Sci-Fi Channel and for the BBC and other European territories. And I think because of Australians by nature, we had a tone of irreverence that was threaded through the whole series, which we may not have had elsewhere. And also we were blessed because the Sci-Fi Channel gave us a lot of rope, really. Um, they wanted it to be sassy, they wanted it to be intelligent and sexy and original and we rose to it really and it's now great talking to directors who say that we've changed them and the way that they work because they're now expecting actors in auditions to to come up with suggestions and to have ideas and uh, a lot of actors in Australia expect to be mollycoddled and to be looked after and have the director give them a lot of attention and what we learnt on Farscape was to just to make informed and hopefully intelligent choices on our own and self-direct in a way because they had so many other elements to take care of while they were directing, which directors often don't have to deal with, but with CGI and the animatronics and all those sorts of things. We were really fortunate that as actors we were able to make a lot of decisions on our own. But also when we did make suggestions, and um, the directors would embrace them. Um, um, so and, and David Kemper pretty much sets the tone of the show as well in that regard and, and Ben took over the, you know, when he was on set Ben would run the set in a way that was highly collaborative and, uh, and it helps when the actors are intelligent to have a lead actor like Ben who's generous and bright um, makes for a really productive working environment so we were very lucky
Maleficent's son. What luscious lips. Amongst other things. Triton was a very lucky man. Where is it? Gone. Gambled and lost. How unfortunate you must lose as well. Poor Aaron has gone through so much on this show and it was part of the appeal of taking the role in the first place. I just felt that she had an incredible arc, potentially. And that was probably realized in season three, which was the hardest year for Aaron emotionally and for me as an actor, an incredible opportunity. Um, so in that season, she chooses to go over to Talon with one of the Crichtons who's been cloned, falls in love with him, meets her mother, who is chasing after her, has to walk away from her mother's assassination because she knows that her mother has to be killed, only to find after John has died, the love of her life, practically in her arms, that her mother is still alive. I'm surprised to see your old mum. This isn't quite the family reunion you'd imagined. So I'd say in The Choice, Erin goes through such an incredible myriad of emotions but seemingly is so numb that she can't even take on the magnitude of it. Was it easy to be a hero? Leave me behind. You never think you're gonna die. I didn't know. You... you did. <laughs> no. Yes. Dead. Finally, in, in season three, yielding and allowing herself to fall in love, having him die, meeting a mum, it not going terribly well, <laughs> then dropping her mum off the side of a building. Um, after she accidentally gets shot by Kreis, and then having to reunite with the other John, I'd say they, those things were the most major parts of her development, and they all happened in season three. Apart from meeting him in the first place and, and no longer being able to be a peacekeeper, that's probably the other milestone. My name's John. your rank and regiment. Exactly how much time have you spent with this human? Hold alien, hold. Present hands. Not a lot. Not much at all. Hands now! Because as you know, Peacekeeper High Command has very clear parameters regarding contact with unclassified alien life forms. You may have very well exceeded those parameters, officers, soon, which no, would make sir, you I... irreversibly contaminated. No, sir, I... Take them away. Take them all away. I think David Kemper and Rockney O'Bannon and Brian Hansen had some ideas about where they wanted the show to go, and I think Sci-Fi Channel definitely had some input as well. Uh, but if you want something, you know, it's, it's like life, you have to be willing to go with the flow. So they had to watch and see how we developed as actors and how the characters were developing based on the choices we were making, how we were bringing these characters yeah. to life. For someone who used to look down her nose at tech work, you're pretty damn good at this. Well, perhaps people can change. Well, at least some people are smiling around here these days. Yeah, I know. It suits your face. I was talking about you. Me? I'm not smiling. Yes, you are. Pay attention to your work. Right. Focus on the work. Um, don't do that. I'm working here. Stop distracting me. I'm distracting you. Yes, you are always distracting me. Well, then you are easily distracted. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. I'm not. Oh, really? <laughs> okay, that's a little distracting. Since a lot of the emphasis is on character in the show rather than story, the, we didn't change the course of the show. We were just part of its growth. <laughs> There's something about the two of those characters that we've asked the audience to invest in, which is about inexorability and the fact that I think they're destined to be together. And I think it is a romance farscape, and that's how Ben and I have always chosen to, uh, to do the show. 
um, as an intelligent romance. That doesn't mean that they're always intelligent, they've been very childish with each other, but they've developed and grown, and I think that's been such an incredible experience for me working on the show. That I think they'd always planned. I think that the producers had always hoped that in their imaginations and their hearts that Crichton and Aaron would always be together. So that's the way I choose to think it was all planned. They always met, you know, from the moment they met. It was destiny. I shouldn't be here. This is exactly where you should be. I love you. I love you too. Ben and I made a decision that we wanted to pull out and expand on as many romantic elements of the storytelling on Farscape as possible. Uh, so one of the episodes that he wrote, Green-Eyed Monster, is, a, is an example. He, um, he exactly. chose to do the story primarily about Aaron in the corner of the triangle, the love triangle. Where are you going? You heard the man, nothing for me to do. John, wait. Aaron, you do not want me there. I, I do want you there. Why? To throw rice? Forget about it. I've seen my share of hardware insertion. I'm not watching. It's been modified. Yeah, I heard that. Less invasive. It's, it's safer. Yes, it's new. It's improved. It's the finger of friendship. 1995. But wait, kids, there's more. What's the matter with you? This is the right thing to do. For who? For all of us. He needs my help to control Talon to get us out. Aaron, do what you have to do. I will. Fine, but do not sugarcoat it for me. Right thing to do, my ass. And what's that supposed to mean? It means that you do things the way you want to, when you want to, with who you want to do them. It's got nothing to do with what I want. It's always about what you want. So there are a lot of elements that used to come into the storytelling about um, love triangles, um, sometimes unrequited love. That was a major theme with Crace and Aaron. The man who sort of basically deems her irreversibly contaminated witnesses in the flashback of the way we weren't as we, as we learned that, that she had basically ratted on her, her lover um, to get promoted. Back to prowler detail. Uh, so Aaron learned the hard way about love in that, in that uh, situation. She was frightened of it. So when she meets Crichton, she has a lot to learn about what it could do and how it can change her life. And then when he dies, it almost destroys her and she goes back to being what she knows, which is a cold, hard peacekeeper, because it's the way they've always been trained. So it's a really interesting, thematically, the concept of love in the story is, is, is fascinating because it's about a woman who's been told she's not allowed to. And then despite herself and despite everything, she cannot help but fall for this man who softens her and teaches her how to actually love properly, um, if there is a proper way to love. Um, and then, you know, the themes with Dargo and Shiana and, and everything, everything comes at a cost. That's the other thing about love on Farscape. There's always a price to pay, and you always have to make a choice between one person or another, and you choose one person and the other person will die or they'll be heartbroken or there'll be some intergalactical disaster. Of, you know, the proportions and the scales were always huge on the show. So, yeah, love was always at the center of a very dynamic story. I had this life. I liked it. It had rules. I followed the rules. And that made everything right. And then you come along and you throw everything up. This strange human with arrogant stubbornness. You are like a plague, John Crichton, and you have ruined my life. And yet I just keep coming back. The decision to clone Crichton was a brilliant one because it meant the producers and the audience, in a way, could have their cake and eat it too. The cake for the audience was to see, finally, Crichton and Aaron together. Eating it too, from the producer's perspective, was that they could then separate us again in quite a substantial way and uh, reset the clock because each season it followed a, a, a pretty repetitive shape. Girl meets boy, 
they like each other, they can't be together, they finally get a chance to be together and something pulls them apart. And each season this would happen in new ways and we were constantly looking for new ways. Radiation. Massive radiation. I couldn't help it. And death was certainly a bit of a, a way to separate them for a while. Um, one thing that David Kemper said at the beginning of the show was he didn't want us to be the aliens in the fast cake world to be so super, superhuman that things didn't hurt emotionally and physically. If you got hit, you had to get some kind of bruise or a scar or blood somewhere. And that's, that's to do with the stakes and the consequences in the universe. And I think it gives it a more human and realistic element. He took some of Pilot's DNA and he... And I didn't... Um... I went back there. I wanted him to find me a place where I could belong. I didn't want to get left behind. I'm so scared. So when people do die, um, often in science fiction, obviously, it's, it's a thing, you know, it's a part of the nature of the genre. People can be exhumed, they can come back. There's wonderful things that happen out in that crazy alien universe that can make people spring to life again. But at the center of that, the Crichton that Aaron falls in love with will never come back. He's a man that she fell completely in love with, and although she likes the other Crichton because they really are the same person, she hasn't shared that same level of development with him. So she has to sort of get to know him all over again and, uh, and concede again to love after losing both her mother twice or three times in her life, but twice in season three, and Crichton. Um, Zan dying, that came at a huge price for Aaron because Zan had made the choice to, to give up her life for Aaron and for Aaron and John. And it goes against everything that Aaron's been trained to believe in. She has to sort of keep a distance from people because they get hurt. Death was always, in our universe, was always something that had to matter and it had to count. Otherwise, the characters stood for nothing and we would cease to care about them and what happened to them. I am reminded at this point of a word that you actually brought to this vessel. Hope. I would be lost without you. Then you'll never be lost. No matter what happened, you have worked your way into my heart. You've shown me that I have one. It's difficult in science fiction to improvise as an actor, and I think <laughs> I think um, the writers at first were um, had chosen the show to work on specifically because their work would end up intact. Not so on Farscape. There were too many things that changed. We were shooting basically the impossible. We had an, un an incredibly difficult schedule. Farscape could not have been made at all in another country. Australia is famous for its fast turnaround television. It's not necessarily very good, but we're famous for it. And we do it, the crew particularly, not necessarily the actors, but the crew do it very well. And the actors who are proficient are excellent technicians. Um, it's difficult to get good work out there as an actor when you're shooting quickly, or for anyone for that matter, the um, director of photography, Everything's always compromised because of time. So considering the quality that we got in the end, it was miraculous. Um, and because of that, because things were always at such a fast pace, the sets were being turned around in overtime by a lot of people working too hard, um, things would have to be changed on the day from the script that had been written, maybe, or devised a month or two beforehand. 
Um, so we were sometimes in a position where the director would have to change something or we would call the people down from the writing department and make sure that they could make the adjustments for us. Some days we hadn't been delivered an entire script, so we would just be given pages and it would develop from there, which becomes incredibly difficult for everyone involved because you want to be taking risks. That's when you really fly as an artist or as a creator of something um, and as filmmakers. So we always had to sort of simplify our choices on those um, occasions because for self-preservation but mostly for the sake of the story because that's all you have so you have to simplify your choices which in at other times I may have taken greater risks as an actor uh, for example the episode that Ben wrote in season four the um, the episode where I played the blonde princess I could take risks there because it was a comedy piece which had to be layered with something a bit more subversive and sinister but at the same time I could basically do whatever I wanted because I was playing a new character completely from scratch. So can I help you find some place to see that thought? And uh, Tony and Ben just said, okay, do the scenes as they're written and then once we get into the fight scene, just go crazy and improvise. And that was probably the largest sort of bulk of improvisation that I've experienced doing on the show. Um, ben improvised a, a fair bit with sort of cultural references and that was often a timely matter because if something had just happened in the news he would reference it that day in the script on the set as it happened so um, we would improvise in those ways oh, wow. wait what? Horus fruit remind me not to put that on my cocoa pops <laughs> is the most physical part I've ever had to play and I totally made it up as I went along because I was the nerd at school that was totally uncoordinated, still am quite uncoordinated, have a very fast metabolism so I've never until now, touch wood, had to diet. I have a very healthy appetite actually, all the crew used to sort of comment on how much food I used to pile on my plate. Um, so I've done a few things here and there when I've actually had an injury from a fight scene, um, because I'm not trained in martial arts in case no one had worked that out, because I admire all the women on TV shows who who have had, you know, training because they look incredible. Um, I'd always be taught how to do something a couple of minutes before we did the scene, and I always felt so unconfident about it. Um, so if I had my time again, I'd love to do the training. I was always supposed to train properly with some guys from our um, special forces, and we could never get it together because it took, Farscape took over our lives in ways that we just could not have imagined. It was bigger than anyone could have, could have expected. And the production office were in the midst of arranging the training and I was still filming Pitch Black. So I didn't have a chance in hell of doing any sort of physical training before it. And in the breaks, we were always going off on publicity tours. So I just used to say a little prayer and Dad rang me one night and said, I've... Um, I watched another episode tonight. You, um, you had a bit of a limp wrist when you were doing your punches. Thanks, Dad. I remember that. <laughs> Physically, it was the most draining project I've ever worked on. We didn't work in conditions that were fantastic, I have to say. We weren't in purpose-built studios. We had no proper air conditioning. They did the best that they could. We had sort of Robbie the Robot portable units which we would attach big tubes to and try and pump cold air into the sets. There were some days where I knew I would not make it through the day unless I was horizontal for about five or ten minutes. So I'd just throw down my lunch and then just have a lie down because it was so exhausting. What are you doing in here anyway? Oh, I just wanted to, um, and be there. Thank you. Don't mention it. Why would I ever mention it? How Australian is Farscape? Well, the speech that David Kemper made at the end of season four, at the end of the, the final scene that was ever filmed, he said this is a show made in Australia primarily by Australians. Um, but as everything with the show, it was a collaboration. I always got the sense that um, the uh, team from England who came out for, um, from the Jim Henson's Creature Shop um, and poor David and Ben who, who for a long time were the only two Americans on, 
on the show or on set permanently. Um, and obviously all the Australians who were involved. I don't think it's a numbers game. I just think it's, it was a, and it was a co-production technically as well. So I suppose individually everyone could answer how Australian is Aaron, how Australian is Dargo, how Australian is Zan. Um, Crichton's 100% prime beef American, that's for sure. Ben Browder, however, is now talking a bit like an Aussie and so are his kids. So um, he's brought a lot of Australia into his heart personally, but I think Crichton, there was never any doubt where Crichton came from. Erin, well, she's sort of a universal chick, a bit like me, travelled around a bit, got a voice that sounds like it's a bit of everywhere. Um, and the show itself, it just belongs to everyone who made it. I don't think it belongs necessarily to Australia. You once said it was as if the fates meant for us to be together. And I believe that. Well, then if it's true, we will be together again. Farscape has meant to me family more than anything and has been reinforced by going to conventions and meeting people who have a mutual love of the show and an enthusiasm for us as well as performers. I'm... I remember the first um, long-term television role that I did, lead role I did, I was so sad when it finished, even though it didn't go for that long, not nearly as long as Farscape, because I would have to say goodbye to these people and I knew I would never see them that way again in the room together ever again, maybe. And uh, I got very attached to people and when you work on something like Farscape for four years, some people come and go. We did a photo where it was just the people who'd been there from the very first day, and there weren't many left, I have to say. There were about maybe 10 maximum from the crew and the actors. And I've carried all of them with me. You know, I, I'll, We try to keep in contact, but we'll never be together as a group again. So while it lasted, it was, it was definitely about our funny, dysfunctional, crazy collaborative family and and after being in New York on September the 11th last year I've been told by a lot of the fans that they consider me part of their group because Ben and I and Ben as well we we experienced this incredible event in our lives in this city and I felt terrible that a lot of these people had traveled interstate or from other countries to be in New York because of us because of the show and uh, I'm so glad that they returned this year safe and sound. So it's been an amazing experience. I didn't expect to get so emotionally connected to people. Um, and they've just been so warm and generous. So, And Farscape has also meant to me creatively that the sky's the limit, that I should just keep aiming for more and better and, you know, to, to, go, to go harder, to go hard with my work, um, to take greater risks, to trust people. I've, I've met the um, continuity of working with some of the same directors and actors has meant that it's been easier to trust other people with my work as well. And that is a big lesson for actors because it's disempowering, really. You do the work and it's out of your hands once it's in the can. It's somebody else's work. Um, so we were very well looked after. So. Farscape's been an incredible opportunity. The best character, I think, in a long time to play. And uh, a lot of fun and a lot of hard work. And, um, yeah, an experience of a lifetime. Let me show you something. Come here. I'm not going to buy it. This is a star chart. These are the names I give the stars. I've already got names. Yeah, I know, but Mantaka 3 sounds boring to me anyway. It's Huey, Louie, Dewey. You see that one? That's that star right there. The bright one. It's my point of reference. My guide. And it always becomes the center of my chart. I always name it Aaron. You say it's your guide. It's my one constant.
Would you like to name some stars? There's a lot of them. And we could take our time. <laughs>